Uh, what I'm supposed to talk to you about is uh, trying to understand how blood vessels uh, can form and to what extent this information can guide us in developing new uh, therapies for diseases that involve uh, too much or too low blood vessel formation. And these are essentially the three main mechanisms that have been recognized uh, responsible for new blood vessel formation. The first one is called vasculogenesis, and this is uh, essentially <coughs> what happens in the embryo when uh, the cardiovascular <coughs> systems uh, start to be formed. There are two regions in the embryo where these uh, structures appear that are blood islands formed by angioblasts that eventually can differentiate into both endothelial cells that form the primitive capillaries and these amantoblasts actually also give rise to um, the cells of the blood. And then there are two additional mechanisms that uh, coexist in adulthood. First one is angiogenesis and is the sprouting of new blood vessels from pre-existing vessels. And the third one is arteriogenesis, which is not real uh, the novel formation of blood vessels, but a kind of remodeling by which small and uh, some, uh, somehow uh, unperfused vessels can be uh, enlarged and become larger arteries. And this is uh, essentially what happens when you have um, a blood clot or something that uh, um, uh, induces stenosis in the coronary artery or peripheral arteries and collateral forms. These uh, mostly form through an arteriogenetic process. So coming back to the embryo, the circulatory system is the first functional unit in the embryo. This is true in most of the animals, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, um, the heart is the first functional organ. This occurs in the mouse embryo at uh, stage embryonic day nine and in a human embryo at five, six weeks. And the processes are quite similar actually. And again, the use of uh, knockout mice has uh, uh, led us understanding the molecular mechanisms involved in the uh, early formation of blood vessels. These are quite old papers published in Nature in 1995 showing that this tyrosine kinase receptor <coughs> is one is essential for the formation of blood islands and the initiation of the whole vasculogenesis process. And this early study has been followed up quite soon by two additional studies showing that the same phenotype, uh, uh, absence of blood islands and vasculogenesis, can uh, be induced by the genetic deficiency of the FLIC1 ligand, which was called VEGF. We already have heard about it later this morning, the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is able to bind to FLIC1, the tyrosine kinase receptor on endothelial cells, and promote endothelial cell proliferation, migration, and formation of primitive capillaries. So uh, the use of different knockout mice have allowed us to understand the main molecular players that are involved in early vasculogenesis process and then subsequently an androgenic sprouting and formation of more complex vascular networks during development but also in adulthood and then maturation to form uh, mature arteries, uh, as we mentioned before, for the arteriogenesis. So, thanks to this model, we have clearly understood that the main player able to induce the whole process in embryonic development and also in adulthood is VGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is able to induce endothelial cell proliferation and migration, and then uh, in order for the uh, new sprouting vessel to mature and become functional, other factors have to intervene and uh, uh, act in a coordinated <coughs> manner to allow proper remodeling of the matrix, recruitment of pericytes to cover the newly formed vessel and stabilize it and get it getting functional. So this process uh, uh, is relevant uh, in two different categories of diseases. 
first one is any kind of tissue ischemia when you don't have blood vessels providing proper supply and in this case you want to induce therapeutic angiogenesis as a strategy to treat uh, ischemia but it's also relevant in different classes of diseases when you have excessive or pathological angiogenesis such as during cancer uh, wet, uh, the wet form of uh, um, adult uh, age-induced macular degeneration and avot at otitis uh, uh, since, since uh, today. So can we explore this information to uh, 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 develop innovative therapeutic strategies? And beside the use of uh, genetically modified animals, there is another way, potent strategy, and potent tool to try to play with angiogenic factors and see what the effect is in vivo, which is the use of viral vectors. I'm sure both Mauro and Fabio have already introduced you into the uh, work of AAV vectors, so I won't spend too much time on that. Just to remind you that these vectors are really powerful to transfuse all kinds of post-mitotic cells, such as brain, heart, and skeletal muscle. So, what happens if you take the VGFA gene, and this is the most potent isoform, composed of 165 amino acids, able to bind this FLIC1 receptor, that is the main angiogenic failure. So what, what happens if you take an AD vector for the overexpression of VGFA? Well, this is the answer in the skeletal muscle. This feature is in the immunohistochemistry uh, level with an antibody against smooth muscle actin, which stains the smooth muscle cells of uh, small arteries and <coughs> the number of arteries physiologically present in the skeletal muscle. And this is after one month of VGF overexpression. You see that there is a huge increase in the number of arteries, but then if you look at the function of these arteries, you clearly see that these are, they don't perform very well. These uh, pictures are obtained by injecting an, a fluorescent uh, uh, lectin inside the circulatory system of the mouse. And this is a reconstruction of a normal skeletal muscle. This black hole are the muscle fibers, and the green signal all around is the capillary network that surrounds every muscle fiber. If you overexpress VGF, you clearly see that the lectin tends to get out of the vessels and extravasate. This means that these vessels formed by VGFA are extremely leaky, as we have heard this morning. So do we have any strategy to uh, allow the maturation of these vessels and allow them to become functional? Over the years, we have exploited several strategies try to induce maturation and function of the newly formed vessels and counteract the leakiness induced by BGF. One of the first approach could be the expression of other factors that intervene and act at the second phase of the angiogenic process and are involved in the maturation of blood vessels. One of these factors is androcoitin 1, which is able to recruit smooth muscle cells around the, gro the, the growing uh, capillaries and thus in uh, induce their stabilization. So uh, these are um, very old style assay to assess vascular permeability that can be performed by injecting a dye. Uh, like the Evans flu, that normally tends to stay inside the vessels, but if the vessels are abnormally leaky, the dye extravasates and permeates the tissue. So this is a muscle injected with an ADVGF, and as you can see, the blue comes out of the vessels, inducing perme in in indicating permeability. But if you co-inject VGF with antropoietin 1, you see here that the dye cannot extravasate anymore, indicating that these co-injections leads to the formation of more mature vessels. And this can also be assessed functionally as Fabio mentioned <coughs> before, using a PET scanner. This is one of clinical use, but can be adapted to image uh, rats in this case. And so when we did this experiment in the past, we observed that actually um, BGF uh, is forming that impressive number of new arteries that we saw at the histological analysis, but when we assessed muscle perfusion, the perfusion was not much increased compared to the other uh, contralateral left. 
And even more importantly, when we induce animal exercising by the use of pacemaker that induce muscle contraction, what we observe is that most of the organs underwent the normal vasodilation that occurs during exercise. You see the brain, the heart, the contralateral legs is much more vascularized and perfused, whether the injected with VGF is even less perfused than in normal condition. So this again indicates that these vessels are leaky and they don't account for an improved perfusion of the muscle. But if you co-inject VGF with angiopoietin 1, you see that you can revert to this pathological phenotype and muscle perfusion get increased. So that could be one strategy to induce vessel maturation <coughs> and functional neangiogenesis in ischemic tissue. The second one could be to play with the time of VGF expression. You have probably heard yesterday that AAV vectors are really potent because they can drive expression of your transgene almost for the entire life of the animal. This could be good on one side, but in this case could lead to excessive VGF production, which may not be beneficial. So what we tried to develop was this, uh, to develop a system in which we can control VGF expression using a drug. And in this case, we built up a two-vector system in which VGF expression is under the control of this promoter that is normally uh, repressed by a TET repressor. But when you add doxycycline, the TET repressor is removed and VGF expression can start. So this uh, is shown here in a culture cell. When you add the doxycycline, you have a VGF expression. When you remove doxycycline, you don't have VGF expression. And the same can be achieved in mice uh, simply by administering doxycycline in the drinking water. You give doxycycline to the animals, you have VGF expression in a muscle, you remove doxycycline, VGF is silenced, you give <coughs> doxycycline again, VGF transcription starts again. So you can really play in vivo. And if you remember this feature, this is normal muscle, this is VGF, abnormal vessels. But if you allow VGF to act for 30 days and then you switch it off, you end up with a situation which is quite similar to the normal one, except for the number of vessels. Here in 80 micron, micron thickness, you have about three capillaries per muscle fibers. Here you cannot count because you don't understand anything. But in this situation, VGF on and off, you end up with eight capillaries in the same thickness. And these capillaries look like normal ones. Again, you can uh, assess the function of these vessels, in this case using single photon emission uh, tomography, which is similar to uh, positron emission tomography. And in this way, we could really prove that uh, this strategy allows to, uh, these vessels to mature and become functional. From this picture, you can also see that what VGF does, besides inducing new blood vessels and increasing permeability, is also to recruit a lot of cells around the newly formed vessels. These are other features showing this important cellular recruitment. So we were intrigued about the possible function of these cells. And we got some insight in their function when we started realizing that actually VGF is not just one molecule but can exist in different splicing eye forms. And I'm just showing here the two most uh, uh, abundant one in, uh, uh, in vivo which are those composed of 165 and 121 uh, uh, amino acids. And the main difference between these two isoforms is the inclusion of exon 7, which codes for a region of the protein that confer the capacity to bind this co-receptor that is called uh, neuropilin 1. So both isoforms can engage VGF receptor 2, click 1, driving endothelial cell proliferation but only VGF A165 can also bind neuropilin 1, whereas 121 cannot. So when we started assessing the uh, uh, androgenic capacity of the two factors, we realized that whereas VGF165 do form these arteries, as I showed you before, VGF121 cannot. If you look by immunofluorescence and you stain endothelial cells in green and smooth muscle cells in red, you can clearly see that both isoforms can induce endothelial cell proliferation and capillary sprouting, as quantified here, 
but only VGF 165 can also form arteries. And if you look at better, you also see that only VGF 165 also recruit B cells around the newly formed vessels. And reminding that the main difference between these two isoforms is the capacity to bind neuropilin 1, which may account for the differential capacity to recruit these cells. We explore the uh, capacity of another ligand for neuropilin 1, which is semaphorin 3A that was originally discovered as a neurotrophic and, and, and uh, uh, chemoattractant molecules in the nervous system, but later engaged also in angiogenesis. SEMA3A is a potent ligand for neuropilin 1, and indeed, even SEMA3A recruits the same cells as PGF. So to make a long story short, we um, uh, could show that neuropilin 1 is uh, essential and is the ligand, uh, sorry, the receptor expressed by these cells that are recruited by both VGF-165 and SEMA3A, and therefore we call these cells NEM, for neuropilin-1 expressing cells. We could prove that they are monocyte, monocyte-like cells. They derive from the bone marrow, and we end up with this model in which we propose that both VGF isoforms can indeed activate the local endothelium, induce endothelial cell proliferation and new capillary formation because they uh, engage PGF receptor 2, click 1, but only 165 can also recruit NEMs, and these NEMs in turn uh, secrete factors such as PDGF and other chemokines that are known to recruit smooth muscle cells to uh, cover the uh, growing capillaries and thus form arteries. So we believe that these cells are essential for the proper maturation of new capillaries and the formation of arteries. And indeed, here again, you have 165 forming new capillaries in green and arteries in red. VGF 121 only capillaries, but if you co-inject VGF 121 with NEMS, here again you have arteries. <coughs> so NEMS can also be purified from the bone marrow as uh, we characterized it by flow cytometry and we could uh, 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 described there as uh, CD11D positive, neuropilin 1 positive, GL1 negative cells. And we show that they uh, look like M1 macrophages. And being having in mind this uh, dual um, role of angiogenesis in ischemic tissue but also in cancer, we were wondering what the effect of uh, NEM and induction of uh, vessel maturation could be in a cancer setting. So we started injecting NEM in different models of cancers. And in every model, here I'm showing you uh, B16 melanoma, ectopic tumors, intrinsic mice, RIF TAC2 uh, transgenic mice that spontaneously develop uh, insulinoma, pancreatic tumors, and orthotopic 41 tumors in, uh, in uh, 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 breast cancer implantation, in all these models, the injection of NAM, which can induce vessel maturation and stabilization, inhibited tumor growth. So we look at the vessels, and indeed what NAM does, what NAM do is to induce uh, uh, the recruitment of smooth muscle cells around uh, VGF to form uh, cancer cells inducing their uh, structural and functional uh, maturation. And this is uh, related to what we were discussing this morning. So the uh, idea that vessel normalization is emerging as a potent strategy to treat the cancer and other angiogenic diseases. And this is a, a very recent uh, um, editorial in Nature Radio Drug Discovery uh, that uh, prompt us to test uh, innovative strategies to induce vessel normalization in cancer as a therapeutic approach. So if all this is true, the uh, conditioning and the administration of the two different isoforms that are differentially able to recruit them at the level of the cancer should have differential effect on, on tumor growth. And so what we did was to condition the tumor microenvironment with either VGF A165, which recruits NEMS and should normalize vessels, or VGF121, and then inject the cancer. And you see here that whereas VGF A121 induces an increase in tumor growth as expected for an angiogenic factor, 
PGF-165 direct to its name actually reduces tumor growth. And when we look at the histology of these tumors, we could see a recruitment, a specific recruitment of NAM in uh, BGF-165 treated cancers. Is this relevant for human cancer? Maybe yes, because we could uh, uh, um, look at the cohort of colorectal cancer patients and looking at the expression of uh, different PGF isoforms. And again, we found that those that express the highest level of PGF-165, and we could find NAMs in these tumors, have a very low score of uh, lymph node and liver metastasis. So in the last two minutes, I just give you a flavor of something that we are doing now uh, in the lab. Uh, when we try to transpose these concepts to an ischemic heart in order to increase uh, uh, the number and the function of uh, uh, blood vessel in uh, after myocardial infarction, we saw that the heart doesn't respond exactly as the muscle does. So here again, you see pictures of a skeletal muscle injected with PGF. You have capillaries in green, arteries in red, and NAMs in blue. But if you do the same in the heart, Essentially, you do see a small increase in arteries in red, but no more lactin staining, endothelial cell proliferation, or NAMS infiltration. Here, you better appreciate an increase in arteries um, uh, in the muscles, a small increase in the arteries, also in the heart. But when you look at endothelial cell proliferation, you see that there are no differences. So endothelial cells in the heart seem not to respond to VGF stimulus. Whereas if you look at the effect of VGF in the developing heart, and you inject VGF in the developing heart, you do see an increase in endothelial cell number and EDU incorporation, meaning endothelial cell proliferation. So now we're trying to understand what's there in the heart that block endothelial cell proliferation. Is there an intrinsic androgenic um, a resistance of endothelial <coughs> cells or there is something else in the heart that block endothelial cell proliferation. We started isolating cardiac endothelial cells at different developmental stages <coughs> using magnetic bits. And actually when uh, you have a new blood vessel formation, you can identify two kinds of endothelial cells. The endothelial tip cell, which is the only cell <coughs> at the age of the growing vessel, and these cells uh, is not proliferating, it simply sends the VGF gradients and emits these filopodia that allows it to sense the VGF gradient and set the direction of the migration. And this uh, endothelial tip cell is followed by endothelial stop cell that instead proliferates just behind <coughs> the tip cell and leads the extension of the growing capillaries. So when we look at the presence of the tip cell in the embryonic heart or the early postnatal heart, we could see the presence of a, a subgroup of cells that are uh, highly expressing VGF receptor 2, which is the main characteristic that distinguishes the tip cell from the stop cell, the level of expression of VGF receptor 2, and this is why this is the first cell that starts migrating in response to VGF. Whereas in the adult heart, we don't see uh, this uh, subpopulation. We also <coughs> see the down regulation during uh, development of other uh, endothelial uh, cell tip markers. And this loss of tip cell markers is parallel by a reduced capacity to the cells uh, to form tubes or macrogen. So adult endothelial cells are not androgenic in this essay compared to uh, uh, neonatal endothelial cells. So we also used other assay to assess uh, and test their capacity to migrate toward VGF gradient. These are embryonic and neonatal endothelial cells that can be seeded in this kind of uh, um, uh, cage. And they can choose whether to go toward this uh, source of VGF or toward this environment where you don't have VGF. And as you can see here, they all go toward VGF. Well, not all, most of them are still on track here, but you really see that they tend to extend phylopodia toward VGF, whereas adult cells don't. They just stay there. They don't migrate. Uh, 
So this is for tip cell, what about stuck cells? Can they proliferate in response to VGF? In this case, we could see that even adult endothelial cells have a subpopulation that do respond to VGF, and they respond maybe even better than neonatal endothelial cells. So they don't migrate, but they do proliferate in response to uh, VGF. And then we uh, also try to move uh, this experiment uh, toward an in vivo situation in which we are vaccinated neonatal endothelial cells and injected either into a skeletal muscle which is permissive to angiogenesis and respond to VGF or into adult heart. And as you can see here, endothelial cells harvested from GFP transgenic mice can form capillaries in a skeletal muscle, but they cannot form capillaries in the heart. So maybe there is really something in the adult heart that blocks these cells uh, and inhibits them uh, and don't allow them to proliferate. And this we can skip. And uh, having in mind uh, the fact that there are other tissues in our bodies that don't contain blood vessels and say a vascular because they produce something that blocks endothelial cell proliferation and invasion, we um, get some suggestion from the cornea which is known to be avascular because of the highest expression of a soluble form of EGF receptor 1, which acts as a trap for VGF, don't allowing VGF itself to bind VGF receptor 2 and inducing an androgenic signaling. So we ask ourselves whether the same could occur in the adult heart, whether there is a high level of soluble split VGF receptor 1 that could and trap VGF and don't allow uh, endothelial cell proliferation and capillary formation. And so we look for the expression of soluble split, and as you can see here, it is expressed in the adult heart much more than in the embryonic heart, both by endothelial cells and uh, by cardiomyocytes. So we use the CRISPR cas to try to target specifically soluble split 1 and knocking it out. And we designed some guide for um, <coughs> in this intron, which is only present in the soluble form. Um, this is just uh, to show the uh, silencing of soluble split by this uh, specific uh, uh, guide and CRISPR system. This is the membrane-bound split, and you see here is the present in the cell lines at the wild type and cells treated with CRISPR and the guide for soluble split. Expression of the membrane bound is not expected. This is soluble split. It's abundantly expressed in the supernatum of this cardiomyocyte cell line, but upon knocking it out with CRISPR, you don't have the protein there. So we produce AV vectors. This is really preliminary. We only have two mice treated, but they are quite promising because here again you see endothelial cells in green upon VGF, they don't proliferate in a normal heart, but if you silence soluble split, you do see the new incorporation in endothelial cells, suggesting that uh, knocking down soluble split, you might have, uh, an, uh, um, you might awake endothelial cells and making them responding to VGF again. Just a final um, concept, uh, what we are trying to understand in the lab now is to what extent the poor androgenic capacity of the adult heart could be related to the poor incidence of uh, cardiac tumors and metastasis despite all the blood passes through the heart several times per minute. And so we started injecting uh, cancer in the adult heart and in the skeletal muscle. And in all models we tested so far, cancer cells grow much more in a muscle than in the heart. And uh, <coughs> we don't have a, a, an explanation yet, but I just want to remind this theoretical course on, at that time the title was a little bit different, was Mouse Behavioral Phenotyping in uh, November 2008. That was the first time uh, this course was organized and I was attending it. And I was participating to this section on depression and I got this uh, note on my notebook and those uh, speakers eventually concluded that when you perform in vivo experiment, do it separately in mice and females, and most of the time you will have two papers out of one experiment. <laughs> so in this case, we started doing it and separate the, the uh, animals between males and females, and what we can conclude so far is uh, indeed 
uh, tumors are, uh, they grow more in muscle than in the heart. If you look at the scale here, they are ti 10 times uh, bigger. And also you do see a sex difference, gender difference in the grow in the heart and not in the muscle. And if you look at the vascularization, you see that female cancer are much more vascularized, even grossly, at the gross appearance compared to male, both in the muscle and also in the heart. Here you really see blood vessels that tend to grow toward the tumor mass, where in the male you don't have this phenotype. So okay, we're just uh, characterizing histologically, but this is really preliminary. I don't have any conclusion, just showing that actually in the heart, the cancer uh, tend to be less vascularized in the normal heart, whereas in the muscle you don't see this difference, uh, and there are parts of the tumors that are more vascularized in the normal muscle. So just the final slide to thank all the people in, in, uh, in the group, and all the collaborators, and especially the group of uh, uh, Mauro and Mauro himself, uh, most of the experiments I showed you uh, in the first part of the talk were performed when I was still part of this uh, laboratory, and actually he's the person with whom I'm still sharing most of the ideas and, and activities. And thank you all very much. Thank you.